pushed up the batting order after the same amount of the blistering start. Uh, but of course, the advantage is that uh, Ram has already set the stage for us very well. Um, let me begin by thanking the Madras Book Club. Uh, I think it's um, uh, it's, it's uh, extraordinarily nice of you to have organized this event uh, to celebrate the work of um, one of the finest historians who has ever lived and worked in this city. So I think um, it's, it's very apt. Uh, also delighted to, to see Mrs. Gopal here and thank her once again uh, for everything. And of course to thank Ram because he didn't say uh, what his own role in this book was. Uh, in fact, this book began with a sort of conversation over coffee that I had with Ram um, in Bangalore maybe about four years ago now. Uh, and it tells you something that it's taken me four years to get this book out. But, uh, so it was then that I suggested to Ram and I was at that point of time uh, working on a book on the sort of foreign and strategic policy of India under Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and um, for someone who is interested in the diplomatic, international, political history of the Nehru years, uh, there was really nowhere else to go but the three volume Magnuson biography uh, of Jawaharlal Nehru by Sarukali Gopal. Uh, and it struck me that, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, it seemed that in the professional world of history and historians, uh, Sarukali Gopal was somehow a forgotten figure. Uh, to the extent that he was remembered, he was seen as someone who was personally very close to Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, had written a biography which was largely celebratory, uh, not critical uh, and so on and so forth. And, uh, but uh, talking to Ram that day, it, it, uh, it, it sort of occurred to me that there was actually a much larger body of work that uh, Sarupati Gopal had left behind, uh, amongst which are um, many of the essays which uh, form part of this book, uh, some scintillating book reviews, uh, some of which have found uh, a place here, as well as a series of lectures which he gave uh, in the 80s, um, um, on, on certain topics which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, so that is how this uh, book began. And I must say that this is still not the entire sort of corpus of Sarupati Gopal. Uh, the quarry is richer than what I have sort of dug out and presented here. Uh, and uh, if, if anyone is to be thanked for having saved all the materials of Mr. Gopal. So I know you will say I'm embarrassing you, but... Um, uh, so let me just give you a brief idea of what this book is about so that you know that you can uh, uh, move on to a discussion I don't want to time. Uh, so, uh, I think this book, uh, as Ram suggested, Sarupali Gopal was uh, not just the finest historian of his generation for a variety of reasons, but easily the most productive of them. Uh, you, you've already mentioned six books, and, and if you look at the 30 plus essays in this volume, with, with many more that I have not uh, included, he is, uh, he by a country mile is ahead of most of his contemporaries, and I would say they're including Ranjit Hua, who of course is an extraordinary historian, but uh, nowhere as productive as Sarupali Gopal was. Uh, so, to that extent, I think uh, this book really uh, gives us an opportunity to re-engage uh, with, with one of the best historians of modern India. Uh, and the essays in this book, and, and my organization of them, uh, really uh, mirror his own interests. And, and the range of them, once again, was something which was a revelation and striking to me as well. Uh, so, Gopal, as Ram suggested, uh, began his career by working on British imperial policy. So, you know, he was very interested in, particularly in the figures whom he considered to be as liberal statesmen of British India. And, and his earlier writings are very much in the, uh, sort of, inspired by the British liberal historiography of India. Yeah. So, there is this underlying assumption that if only Britain had had a few more of these kind of statesmen, yeah, so like Gladstone, Ripon, so on and so forth, then maybe the Indian British encounter would have been very different. The character of it would have been very different. Some of the bitterness which uh, sort of the experience left behind would have been mitigated, and that some far sighted policies, if uh, adopted in time, would have transformed the basis, nature, and character of this relationship. So that was the sort of underlying historiographical uh, tendency with which Gopal really approached his uh, early work on uh, Ripon, on Urban. In fact, the choice of figures itself is striking because he did not go to the more unsympathetic figures, he did work on people like Curzon, but that came subsequently. Uh, and, and then, of course, the capstone to that particular uh, part of his life was his uh, book on British policy in India, which uh, primarily looks at the formulation of policy in a range of spheres starting from 1857 uh, until 1905 uh, with, with the sort of uh, partition of Bengal and so on. Uh, now, the, the book, uh, and thereafter, of course, Gopal moved on to work uh, on Indian nationalism, and, and there, of course, uh, that, that particular body of work took up the form of a three-volume biography of Jawaharlal Nehru and subsequently a biography uh, of his own father, Sarupali uh, Radha Now, uh, the, the, the first couple of sections in the book really mirror this particular tendency, but uh, the essays are not in any sense a reproduction or a shortened version of the work that he did there. 
Uh, in many ways, these are much more reflective essays. These are essays where Gopal is going back to the work which he did as a young man and trying to revisit some of those premises. And, and there, I think, uh, uh, many of these essays bear out this quality which Ram quite nightly underlined, which is that uh, he was not shy of revisiting his own uh, ideas in the light of new evidence, in the light of new interpretations. Um, ultimately, history is not something out there to be discovered, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's history itself is an act of creation, and then how you interpret the past very much uh, depends not just on the materials that you use, but the presuppositions that you bring to that material. And here it's striking to see how uh, the, the first section of the book, uh, which really uh, looks at uh, a series of essays that Gopal uh, had written about, uh, imperial figures, starting from Gladstone, someone whom he uh, admired as a young man. In fact, if you read his biography of Ripon, you will see that uh, you know Gladstone is a figure who's sort of uh, presented in fairly sort of positive light. Uh, but by 1973, when the essay on Gladstone is being written here, uh, Gopal has a much more mm -hmm. astringent, a much more critical view of what even the policy under the liberal governments were uh, towards India. Uh, that section uh, has uh, another set of essays on figures like Curzon, you have uh, a very interesting essay written on Churchill, uh, and, and in fact, that, that essay on Churchill was written as part of a very large conference uh, which, which uh, sort of took a historical stop of Churchill's legacy in the early 1990s, and uh, the great historian Michael Howard, who was also uh, Gopal's contemporary from Oxford, uh, in reviewing the book said that, you know, every essay in this book says that Churchill was a great statesman, perhaps a great statesman of the 20th century, except for one, uh, the Indian historian Philip but he says that even this historian, however, writes more in sorrow than in anger. And, and, and I think that captures really well, which was that uh, Gopal was not shy of making judgments on people, but he always understood what the context was within which they were operating. And each of these essays really is, is, is a, uh, a marvelous attempt to go back and revisit some of the assumptions on which the uh, first 15 years or so of his uh, scholarly career really panned out. And that, I think, takes a lot of courage uh, to go back and look at the work which you've done and say that uh, some of that stuff did not, does not really hold up in the light of what you believe and what you say today. Bose as a paradoxical figure. 
he says that on the one hand, Bose was a product of a certain tradition which matured in Bengal, and he could not really sort of get away from that tradition. But on the, on the other hand, Bose also wanted to sort of align himself with a certain form of radical politics, and that's really it is the tension between these two streams which uh, uh, you know influenced much of the Bose that uh, explained much of his uh, stances, his behavior, his policies, and so on. Um, similarly, there's an, a very interesting and sympathetic assessment of Balabai Patel, uh, a figure who Gopal does not really criticize in any serious terms in the Nehru biography, but does not uh, really give enough credit as well. So in a variety of ways, these essays, uh, I, I think, once again show that here was a man who was uh, not just willing to sort of take on board criticisms of his own work, but also go back and revisit some of those uh, assumptions and some of those judgments which he had made in the past. The other two sections of the book, really, uh, were to me the most revealing ones, uh, partly because they uh, revealed uh, uh, certain facets of Gopal's life which uh, to me were not all obvious, uh, partly because I only read his historical work. And, and these two sections of the book, uh, the third one, really deals with uh, Gopal's writings on contemporary India. So there are essays here about Indian democracy, Indian secularism, there is even a fantastic essay, and in fact my personal favourite in this entire collection, which is uh, about the English language in India and its future. Yeah. And this is an essay which was written before this boom in Indian writing uh, uh, in English really began uh, in the early 1990s. And even before that, Gopal was able to sort of understand the importance of the English language in this country. So, uh, uh, in a sense, these are a series of essays which are also delivered as lectures at a particularly testing time as far as Gopal is concerned in Indian public life. Till the mid 1970s, you know, uh, Gopal, like many figures who are very influential in the corridors of power, uh, really kept his own counsel to himself. Uh, I'm sure uh, his voice was uh, carried weight in, in, in the areas that matter. Uh, but uh, he was never really a public intellectual in the sense in which you know uh, he, he became in the 80s. And, and here I think there are three events which really mark the shift in his life. The first is the imposition of the emergency here, yeah, uh, which, which Gopal uh, very strongly criticized and in fact passed a resolution in the Indian History Congress uh, against the 42nd Amendment of the Indian Constitution, brought in by Mrs. Gandhi, uh, saying that it was an uh, attack on academic freedom itself. And uh, this was uh, at, at the Rages Act, I think, in, in, in two different ways. Uh, first of course was that he had a relationship with Mrs. Indira Gandhi going back some time. Uh, the second was that not many of Gopal's own colleagues, particularly in Jawaharlal Nehru University where he used to teach, were too happy about you know openly criticizing uh, this thing, partly because you know there was this group of historians in JNU uh, who, who were uh, Gopal's contemporaries uh, who were aligned with the line taken by the Communist Party of India, which in turn was supportive of the emergency itself. Yeah. So, so that, that was the first thing. The second thing which happened somewhat uh, a few years later, once the Janata Party government and the coalition comes into power, uh, is, is about this controversy over revisiting of the textbooks which were returned for the NCR. Yeah. So this is, seems to have become a periodic feature of Indian public life, where right? textbooks particularly to dealing with polity and this, politics and history uh, are seen as, you know, take uh, trying to peddle a certain political line and that uh, a new government in town wants to sort of recorrect those things. And, and uh, here again the interesting uh, thing is the stance which Gopal takes in support of a uh, set of textbooks written by what you might call as Marxist or very Marxist sound historians. And, and in writing that essay, and that, uh, it is reproduced from seminar here, Gopal makes it very clear that he himself is not Marxist historian. He says that, you know, uh, yeah, some historian, some Politicians have referred to me as a Marxist historian, and they're completely wrong. They say that I'm not a Marxist historian. But the writing of Indian history would be extraordinarily impoverished if Marxist historians did not have a place. And that again, I think, was uh, you know something which is a very interesting feature of his own uh, life and thinking. And the third, uh, the one with which uh, uh, the, the public cause with which he came to be associated most most strongly in the 1980s was the uh, Ramjan Bhumi Babri Masjid issue, uh, on which he wrote uh, a lot of essays uh, and had also edited a book. Uh, on the historical dimensions of that question itself. Uh, the final section of the book really uh, shows us that Gopal had a range of interests which went beyond history and contemporary politics uh, of India. Uh, there are mostly review articles but also other short pieces which are written uh, which, which showcases interest in literature. There is a, a non-published review of The Hill of Devi by E.M. Foster uh, and then Foster was one of uh, Gopal's uh, sort of yeah. most favorite writers on India, uh, in, uh, and there are uh, there is a review, a very interesting one, of uh, a book by Robert Kanigal uh, on Srinivasa Ramanujan, the mathematician, called The Man Who Knew Infinity. And I think uh, Gopal's uh, uh, review of that book, which is quite critical, 
brings out three facets of his, of his narrative. And, and in many ways, in these essays, he's a lot more forthcoming than he is in his. Uh, so uh, Gopal criticizes Canigal for, first of all, teaching a, an audience how to say Pachaya Pass College. He says that anyone who's trying to teach people how to say Pachaya Pass College does not, is writing primarily for an American audience, not for an Indian audience. <laughs> the second thing he says, and here the Oxford man in really comes into uh, play, is he says that uh, Robert Canigal is teaching the readers how to pronounce Middle Miss term, which is the first term in Oxford. And he says that you know no self-respecting biographer should be doing these sorts of things. And the third thing that uh, uh, Gopal uh, criticizes Canigal for uh, uh, doing is to suggest that uh, some of the intellectual context in which uh, Ramanujan was uh, you know operating was entirely built, filled with religion and superstition and so on and so forth, and that there were no other traditions in the intellectual milieu in which uh, 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 in which Srinivas Ramanujan grew up. So in in each of these ways, uh, you know Gopal. Uh, Interests really range far and wide beyond uh, the normal worlds of history and politics. And there is a, a short uh, set of essays on uh, Gopal's other uh, great love of his life, which is cricket, uh, including a book uh, which was put together by Ram So I think it's uh, altogether fitting that uh, Ram should be here as well today. Uh, so to summarize, I think these essays really capture a series of qualities of Gopal, some of which Ram has already referred to, uh, but I think are sort of worth uh, reiterating. The first is the range of his historical interests. Uh, Gopal was the first Indian historian to take the business of contemporary history seriously. And I think this is sort of worth emphasizing because uh, you know, contemporary history is generally seen as suspect even amongst the general discipline of history. Uh, partly because uh, historians tend to assume that the further you are from a subject in terms of time, the more objective your treatment is going to be and so on. So objectivity is measured in terms of time rather than that. And Gopal actually has a very nice line uh, in an essay which is written in the late 1980s when the Ram Jan Bhumi uh, Babi Masjid uh, dispute is being played out, saying that actually the kinds of history which seems to excite the most interest, rancor, and passion are about things which happened a few centuries ago rather than what happened a few decades ago. So, in that sense, there is no reason why contemporary history should not be in our thing. And here, I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, Gopal was a pioneer of contemporary history not just in India but globally. I mean, his first book on, his second book on urban. Uh, which was written in the early 1950s, based entirely on interviews and so on and so forth, was being written at a time when contemporary history was not fashionable even in Oxford, in, in that particular milieu where Gopal himself grew up and, and first uh, contributed. The second is this astonishing range of contemporary cultural references in his writings. Uh, clearly, he was a man who was very immersed in the world in which he was living uh, and, and um, you know, was kept up with many aspects of the society uh, in which he operated, which by which I not just assume here in India, but also Oxford, with which he had a lifelong connection, more or less. Uh, in fact, uh, there is one very nice essay here on Gandhi, uh, where the two sources that Gopal really quotes uh, are, one, he quotes those immortal lines from Paul Porter's uh, famous song, You're the Top, which says, You're the Top, You're Mahatma Gandhi, You're the Top, You're Napoleon Brandy. <laughs> The second, which I think uh, I will follow uh, Ram's suggestion, is, is this uh, extract from a biography written by the singer, American singer, folk singer, Joan Baez, uh, which was written really in the late 1960s. And Gobal uses this in his piece on Gandhi. Let me just very quickly come here. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is Gobal writing, and I'll just quote verbatim. The white American singer, Joan Baez, in her autobiography published in 1966, reports a dialogue between her husband and their 11-year-old daughter, and he quotes the dialogue. Did Gandhi have a penis? She asked. This was the girl, the 11-year-old. Yes, he answered, which is the father. The girl pipes up. Did he have a vagina too? No, said Ira. He was a man, and men just have a penis. Well, she said, pausing in the doorway. It's just that he was so nice, I thought he might have had both. <laughs> so, uh, that's the sort of uh, sensibility that this historian really brought uh, to the writing of uh, fairly important subjects. Uh, Ram has already spoken about Gopal's extraordinary mastery of English language. Uh, and in some ways, uh, one of his primary sort of motivations, the wellsprings of his historical work, really was in this business handling of the language, uh, get, and he's just congenitally incapable of writing a bad sentence. Uh, and and uh, his, his, his pro style, uh, as I sort of immerse myself in his writing, I think has got, a, there's a certain signature style to 
right? So the, the pose is mostly even. Very elegant, very smooth, very polished. And suddenly you have this thunderbolt which falls on the surface by way of an extraordinarily critical assessment of whoever it is that he's writing about. So that is how really the rhythm continues. And, and it's quite marvelous that the music of his prose itself is sort of worth uh, immersing yourself in. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that many of these essays, uh, and not just about historical subjects, but also about contemporary politics and so on, uh, I think point to the fact that Sarupali Gopal was possibly the last Indian historian who had serious close experience both of policy making. He had worked in the Ministry of External Affairs uh, in the 1950s, was very closely involved in the whole boundary negotiations with China. Uh, in fact, he writes in his uh, biography of Dara Nehru that for a period of three years I used to see him every day. He does not say why, but it's actually over the boundary dispute uh, because Gopal is the one who's preparing the Indian case, as it were, uh, for uh, the boundary negotiations, so was very closely involved. But also saw politics at a very close level, uh, partly because he continued to uh, live with his father, Radha Krishna, even after Radha Krishna became president. Uh, and uh, ha so, in, in this sense, he, he really is unique and irreplaceable uh, in, a, in, in the sort of knowledge of the nitty gritty of policy making and politics that he brought to his writing of his history. Uh, and finally, there is there is uh, there is a liberal sensibility to his writings. Uh, I, as, as Ram suggested. You know, Gopal was a certain sort of liberal, and, and uh, I don't want to try and define what form of liberal was he in politics and economics and so on. But by liberal sensibility, I mean uh, an assumption that you know the domain of ideas is really always should be open to contestation, and that in many ways the pursuit of truth is uh, you know is, is, is the contest in the search of pursuit of truth is is uh, something that is a source of pleasure in its own right. Uh, I think this was something Gopal very strongly believed in, uh, which is why he was not just willing to change his own mind about uh, other things, but also different people who were quite different in their political, historical sensibilities than what it was. So, together these range of qualities I think are remarkably sort of absent in the world of professional history today. Partly because uh, I think it's become um, a very academic business with its own sort of guilt conceits and so on and so forth. Um, I know that saying this while Ram is sitting here might uh, seem like anomalous, but Ram, I can assure you, is the exception who proves the rule that I just stated. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's therefore all the more important that not just professional historians, but citizens, but people, ordinary people who are interested in reading good history, in uh, reading sensible politics, and above all, in reading very good prose, uh, should certainly start with this book. Thank you.